Hello there, Mark Cunningham here, welcoming you to my video on Google Sheets at an advanced level. Before we kick off, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about this video. I actually used to sell this as a full length course, which is why I call it a course in the title and description. However, I recently decided to put it up on YouTube so you can go ahead and watch the whole thing for free. Now, because this was a course, there is a practice spreadsheet that you can use to follow along with the lessons in this video. You don't have to use it if you don't want to, but it does help, so I recommend using it if you can. So to use the practice spreadsheet, log into your Google account, then click on the link in the description of this YouTube video. Once the practice spreadsheet is open, do not click on the share button. Instead, click on file, then make a copy, and then give it whatever name you like before clicking on OK to save it. You should then have your own copy of the spreadsheet that you can use to follow along with the lessons. The way this works is that for each lesson, I will do a demonstration on a worksheet that does not have the blue line at the bottom, while you can practice the teachings on the corresponding tab that does have a blue line at the bottom. That way you can learn by doing rather than just watching. And one more thing before we get started, if you want to go straight to any specific part of this video, just click on the timestamps in the description below. Okay, that's it for the intro. Let's get started on the lessons. Before we get into learning some array functions, I thought I'd give you a quick lesson on what an array actually is. In spreadsheeting, an array is a table of values organized by rows and columns. In the example shown here, there is an array consisting of six rows and four columns. One of the main reasons arrays are used in spreadsheets is that an array function can output a range of cells, while a regular function will only output into one cell. What this means is that array functions can populate data into cells that do not actually contain the function itself. If you put an array function into one cell, it can return values into that cell and lots of other cells on the same worksheet. If you compare that to a regular function, such as sum, it will only output a value into the same cell that contains the sum function. It will not output values into any other cells on the worksheet. In the following lectures, we're going to start with a basic demonstration of arrays in Google Sheets before taking a look at a number of very useful array functions. After that, we'll combine some of these functions to see how they can be used as a powerful way to extract data and organize outputs. So let's begin by looking at the most basic way to create an array of outputs, which is by using curly brackets within a cell. We're going to start off our lessons on arrays by having a look at how we can create an array using curly brackets in a formula. So I'm going to do that on the arrays curly brackets tab, and I'm going to do it up here in exercise one under one row. So if I just start off a formula here by pressing on the equal sign, and then I just open the curly brackets, what I'm going to do is create a row that has one, two, and three in separate cells. And the way we do that is we do one comma two comma three. So the commas tell Google Sheets to put these values in different cells. And then we just close the curly brackets and we hit enter. So you can see now with that one formula in cell B6, we've actually populated three cells in B, C and D6 with one, two and three. So we don't actually have a formula here in C6 or D6. Those values there have been populated by the array formula that we've put in there in B6. So that's how you create a basic one row array just using a formula in one cell. So the next thing I'm going to do is come over to this exercise here for two rows and I'm going to create another array formula. So I'll just start that off. And I'm gonna do the same thing as last time with one, two and three in the top row. So that's one comma two comma three but I'm going to create a second row. And the way that you do that is you use the semicolon to tell Google Sheets to put the next value starting on the next row down. So let's, let's make that one nine, eight and seven. And then we'll close the curly brackets and hit enter. And now you can see we have an array that's got three columns and two rows and we've done that just with one formula there in G6. So there's no formulas in any of these other cells. So that's how you can create 
two rows, you just need to use the semicolon to separate the values out to tell sheets to go down to the next row. So finally, I'm just going to create one now with three rows, and I'm also going to show you that you don't just need to put numbers in there, you can put um, text in there as well. So I'll just start that one off like that. One, two, and three. And then the next row down will do nine, eight, and seven again. And then the next row down will do A, B, and C. And when you put those in, you need to do that. You need to put them in inverted commas. So there's A, B, and C. And then if we close off our curly brackets and hit enter, then we have an array there with three rows and three columns. And the bottom row there is all letters, A, B, and C. And once again, you can see that's all been populated by the one formula there in L6. So the next thing I want to show you is how you can use an array formula to grab some values that already exist on your spreadsheet. So you don't need to just type values into the formula like this. You can actually use values that are already there. So down here, you can see we've got this table of information and all of that stuff is just values that are pasted in there. So we're going to use our array formula to extract the numbers and the prices. So we're going to grab all this information here and this information here, and we're going to paste it into here, but we're going to do it just with the one array formula. So the way you do that is you just start off your array with the curly brackets and the equal sign. And now instead of actually typing um, values in there, we can just do cell references. So we can just drag the mouse over here like this. And then we can just put in a comma because we want that to start on the same row here. And then we can just drag the mouse over there like that. We can close it off, hit enter, and there you go. So we've got the 10 down to the 55 and we've got the $150 down to the $30 there. And all of that has been brought over just with that one formula there in G18. So the next thing I want to show you is how you can do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to show you that you don't need to go from left to right. You can, you can grab the data in whatever order you like. So we'll do code and item. So we've got code and then we'll shift one to the left there and we'll grab the items. So it's a very similar formula to the one that we just did before. We just go equals and curly brackets. So the first one we want is code. We'll just drag the mouse over there, comma, and then item, drag the mouse over there, close it off, enter, and there you go. So we've grabbed all of that information and some of that is text as well. In fact, it's all text. So you can see that's brought the text over just fine. And we've brought that over um, in the reverse order then we've brought the data um, over on this one here. So the reason that I wanted to show you that is because as you probably know, V lookups, you need to look up something over on the left hand side and then it finds something over on the right hand side. You can't actually go backwards. So if we do a simple V lookup here where we look up this value, so I'll just copy that out and I'll just do a, a simple V lookup formula over here. So we want to search for that particular code down here and the range is going to be these cells here. And let's just say we want to return the price. So that's column three. And we want it to be an exact match. So I'll put zero there and close it off. And there we go. So we've got $17. So what we've done is we've, we've looked up this code right here and we've extracted the $17 out of there. So it goes from left to right. And we can't do that in reverse with just a normal V lookup. But if we use an array function, we actually can do it. So I'll just show you how that works. We'll do it over here where we look up the item based on the code instead of looking up the price based on the code. So once again, we're going to look up that particular code. And now this time, instead of putting our cell references in the way we normally do with the V lookup formula, we're actually going to put in an array. 
So we'll just start off the array with our curly brackets and we're going to be looking up the code. So we'll just grab that. And we want to also look up the item like so. Close that off, put in our column reference and that's our result. So what we've done here, if I just click back onto the formula bar up there so we can see what we've done, we've looked up that code, which we know is down here. And then instead of going left to right, we've actually told Google Sheets to go right to left by putting in our array formula in the middle here where we look up column C and then column B and we want to return the value out of the second column which happens to be the item one because that's what we've put in here. So we've actually used an array function to do a VLOOKUP that looks up from right to left instead of left to right. So that's just one of many things that you can do with these array functions. So as you can see, array functions are pretty handy and that was just a quick lesson to begin with to show you how you can create them just by putting a formula in one cell, how you can extract some information out that's already there in your spreadsheet, and also how you can combine it with things like lookups to make them uh, quite a powerful tool to use. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how you can tell Google Sheets to create an array out of a non-array formula or function. So I'm going to demonstrate this on the array formula tab. And what I've got here is a little table of information where we've just got some items down here, some products. Each one of them has got a code, which is just some text. And then we've got the number of sales and the price per sale for each item. So if we wanted to find out what the total sales per item was, then we would need to just go into this column here and do a little formula where we do D multiplied by E, and then we get $1,500 worth of sales there for the shoes. And then if we wanted to do that for all of the different items and the different rows, we can just drag the formula down like that. So that's how you can achieve that just with a simple formula. And of course you need to put a formula in every single row, but we can use this array formula function and we can actually achieve the same thing by just putting the array formula function into one cell. So what we can do is we can go here where we've got total sales per item as an exercise, and we'll do it here in cell H6. So you just start off the array formula by typing it in like that, and Sheets will bring it up like this, and you can just click on that if you like, or press enter. And that starts off your array formula. And now what you can do is you can tell it to grab all of the information here in column D and multiply it by column E. And then if we close that off and hit enter, you can see that we get exactly the same result for each row there that we did over here when we did the formulas individually. So we've got a formula in each cell there. But if we come over here, we've just got the function there and then it's just gone ahead and populated the rest of the cells down there like that, which means we've created an array of outputs from what is actually just a simple multiplication formula wrapped up in that array formula function. So that's a very basic example to get started. The next thing I'm going to show you is how we can get a grand total as well. So ordinarily we would come over here and we would put in a sum function and we would just run the mouse over there and add those up. So we get 7476 as our total sales for all of the items together. If we wanted to do that just with an array function, what we can do is I'm actually going to use this one that we've already created. But before I do that, I'm just going to lock those cells into place. So I'll just F4 there and F4 there. And that way I can copy it over here like this and get the same result. Only this time, instead of showing all of the results individually for each row, I just want to show the grand total. So I want to get 7476. 
And the way you can do that is if you just wrap the whole thing up in a regular sum function. So I can just start it off like that, come up to the other end, close the brackets and hit enter. And there you go, we get 7476. And just to demonstrate, if I just go and delete all of that, you can see that these results over here and this result over here is not actually relying on what we had there in column F. So that is actually going in and doing every um, cell in D multiplied by the corresponding cell in E and going down the list and doing that. And then it's summing it all together and giving us just the one result there. So there's no need to actually have a column over there and a sum down the bottom. So I'll just undo that just to put it back just for demonstration purposes. And we'll move on to the final exercise that I've got on this particular lecture. And what I want to do here is I actually want to bring all of this over into here with, with an array function. And I also want to have the total column as well. So let's start off by just bringing the information over that's already there. So we'll do that with our curly brackets. Just get that started like that. Drag the mouse over like that. Close it off and hit enter. And you can see that that's brought all of the information over and it's populated all of the cells there just with using that one curly brackets formula there in L6. And the last thing we want to do is create a column that has the total sales per row. So it's going to look the same as this column over here. So we can do that inside of our curly brackets. If we just go up to the formula bar and we hit comma because we want it to actually start off on the same row just over there in P6. And we want to bring up an array formula. like so. And then we want to have column D, which I will just anchor into place with F4 multiplied by column E. And I'll just anchor that in for good practice as well. Close it off. And we already have our curly brackets closed. So if we hit enter, you can see there that it's gone and populated column P with column N multiplied by column O. So we actually have a total sales column on the end there. And that all comes from this function over here in L6. And just to show you once again, if I go over here and I just delete that, you can see that all of this information over here, particularly this um, information here on the end on column P does not rely on what we typed in there before. That all comes from that array function. So there you have it. That's a little exercise to take you a little bit deeper with arrays and to show you how the array formula function works in Google Sheets. In this lesson, I'm going to show you a function that you can use to constrain the number of results that you get when you create an array. So I'll start off over here by just creating a normal array with the curly brackets. So if we do that, and then we just choose everything here in uh, column E. And then we'll close the brackets and hit enter. And that's brought all of the results over. So there's six results there, it's populated them all. But if we just wanted, say, the top three, we can do it in a different way by using array constraint. So I'll just delete that. And we'll just get that one started. So array constraint. And then what you need to do is you need to pick the range. So we'll just pick that same range and then hit comma. And then you need to do the number of rows and the number of columns. So let's just say we want to do three rows. So we'll just put in three and then comma. And then we've just got the one column anyway. So we'll just put in one and then we close that off and hit enter. And as you can see, that has given us just the first three rows. So that's just a simple array function that you can use there called array constrain to constrain the number of results that you get in an array. 
In this lesson, we're going to have a look at how you can multiply two matrices together by using the matrix multiplication function or mmult. So if you go to the mmult tab, we're going to do it there. And what we've got is up the top here, I've got two tables of information. The first one here, I've got some cities here in Australia. And then across the top, I've got the names of some products that we sell. And within here, I've got the data as to how many products that we've sold. So Brisbane has sold 10 shoes and Sydney has sold four pairs of shoes. And then over on the next table, we've got those same products down here. And then we have their prices that they sell for and also the amount that it costs to post those items to customers who buy them online. So what I want to do is down here in this table, in this cell here, I want to get the total sales for Brisbane, which means we need to get that 10 there multiplied by the $109 plus the 104 multiplied by $55 etc all the way along and all the way down these items and prices so if you were going to try and do that just with basic formulas you would end up having a very long formula as you can imagine where you'd need to have 10 multiplied by 109 plus 104 multiplied by 55 etc so that would be difficult to create in the first place but it would also be difficult to copy it down into the other cities so you'd basically have to recreate the whole thing all over again because anchoring some of the um, cell references into place probably wouldn't even work. So to save us from having to do that, we can use the mmult function. And to get it to work, we just need to have the number of columns along here, the same number as the number of rows down here. So we've got six columns, we've got six items, and then we've got six rows down here where we've got their prices. So to do that, it's just as simple as starting off the function like so, and then we just pick matrix one, which is these cells here, comma, and then we pick matrix two, which are the prices down here. We can close that off and hit enter. And because that's an array function, it goes ahead and populates all the rest of the cities down here. So you can see there's no functions in there, but there are results. So we've got the function here uh, for total sales in Brisbane. So that 13,428 is the result of what I said before. So it's 10 by 109 plus 104 by 55, etc., all the way through, gets you 13,428, and then it's gone ahead and done that for all the other cities as well. So that's a great way to get that done just with one function. What we can also do is we can also get the postage down there as well in the results. We just need to use our curly brackets to create an array. So let's just get that started over here. We'll just go open curly brackets and mult, and then we'll pick our first matrix along here. And then this time when we pick our second matrix, we're going to get the price and the postage in there like that close the brackets and then close off the curly brackets. And you can see there that that's gone ahead and given us the same results as we've got up here for the sales. And it's also gone across to our next cell references and it's multiplied the 10 by the 22 and the 104 by the eight, etc. added them together. And it's got the total postage there of 2243. So you can see again, that we've got the cell references referring to those two columns there. And it's gone ahead and just populated all of those rows and columns down there. So that's how you can use the mmult function to multiply two matrices together. We're going to have a quick look now at the transpose function. So I'm just going to do that on the transpose tab. Now this is an actual function. This is not copying and paste special with transpose. So we actually need to go in and type in a function. And we're going to do that here for these numbers one to nine that are going down this column here. We're going to transpose them so that they go across here from cell E5. 
So we'll just start off the function like so, and I'll just pick transpose there. And all you need to do is just choose the array or the range. So you just need to choose it like that and then close it off, hit enter. And there you can see that we have copied all of that there, pasted it across here. And we've done that all just with the one function there in cell E5. So that's how you can do it with just one um, column there of information. So I just want to also show you that you can do it for columns and rows combined as well. So we'll just do that over here. We'll just start it off there like that. And we'll choose the whole lot. Close it off, hit enter. And you can now see that we've turned the columns into rows and the rows into columns for that table of data over there. So that's how you use the transpose array function. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at the sum product function, and I'm going to complete the exercises on the sum product tab. So the first one we're going to do is a very simple one, and we're going to do a total of the sales for these products. So it'll be 10 multiplied by 150 plus four multiplied by 22, etc. And we're going to do that with just one sum product function. So I'll just start that one off. And I'll just choose it down here. And you can see here that it says that it is the sum of the products of two arrays. So all we need to do is just pick our arrays. So we can pick the first one like this and the second one like this, close it off. And that gets us our answer, which is 7,476. So that's the total number of sales based on the number of sales by the prices for each of those products. So that's a very simple one there. The next thing I'm going to show you is how you can put some conditions on that so you can use it almost like a, a sum if. So I'm going to do that over here with this table of information where we have some auction payments and some refunds. So I'll start that one off here and we'll choose our sum product. And for this one, we're going to have our, we're gonna have the condition that we just choose the auction payments. So we just want to grab that column of data there, which I'll anchor in with F4. And then I will say equals auction payment. So I just need to type that in. And then we want to have that multiplied by the gross over here like that. I need to close that off, but I actually need to go and put another open bracket over here. And if I hit enter, that's now going through and it's adding up the gross column here, anything that corresponds to auction payment. So it's sort of like doing a sum if we're saying if if there's an auction payment, then we want you to grab the data over here and add it together. So that's step one. The next thing we need to do is actually multiply it by the quantity. So I'm just going to use the exact same function. So if I go back into it, and in fact, I'll anchor in that information there as well for gross. And then I can copy and paste that whole thing down there. So it's just exactly the same. And this time what we want to do is we want to just grab that whole thing again and we want to pick our second array, but instead of it being column N, we're going to have it as column M and then we'll lock that one into place as well. So now we're saying for everything that is an auction payment down here in column J, we want you to grab the gross and we want you to multiply it by the quantity and then give us a sum of the whole lot, just like we did over here where we summed the whole lot together. So if I hit enter there, that's now given us a different answer to what we had just up here when we were just using the one column of information. So now we've got the total there of 
say this row here where it's 1 by 33 plus 1 by 298.50 plus 4 by 314 etc all the way down for the auction payments gives us a grand total of $5,063.60. So that's how you can use the sum product function to get the totals of two different arrays multiplied together and you can also put some conditions in it just like you can for a sum if. In this lesson we're going to have a look at the filter array function in Google Sheets. So I'm going to do the exercises here on the filter tab and I just want to start off by pointing out that we're not actually looking at the filter tool, the create a filter tool here in the uh, data menu. We're actually looking at the filter function itself. So what we've got here is a table of data. So we've just got some auction payments, um, some sales and some payment refunds. We've got some quantities and grosses, etc. So we're going to create a function to filter out information out of here. So we'll start off first by just having a one column output. And what we're going to do is we're going to filter out all of the gross amounts that correspond to auction payments. So we'll just get the function started, like so. And all we need to do is pick our range and then do our condition. So the range is going to be there. And then we can hit comma and we can do the condition. So the condition is going to come out of column C like that and we want it to equal the text auction payment. So we just need to put it in quotes. Like that. And then we can close it off and hit enter. And now you can see we've created an array output there. We've just got the one function here in cell B25 and we have no more functions in here but it's given us the outputs and it's grabbed all of the gross amounts down here and it's left out those refunds it's left out the negative amount so there's none showing there so that's how you can use the filter function just to do a basic one column output with one condition so let's do one now with two conditions so i'll just start that off filter and we'll do the same output, we'll do gross. And this time for condition one, let's grab that there. And this time we'll do payment refund. So we'll just say equals. Payment refund like that. And now we'll put in a comma and we'll do our second condition. And what we'll do is we'll get the quantities and we'll make that condition so that the quantity is just one. And then we'll close it off and hit enter. And that's given us three refund amounts out of there. So it's got the minus 49, which just has the quantity of one there like that. And then there's another one there and another one there. And this one down here, the minus 133 that has a quantity of two, it has not returned that. So it's taken on those two conditions and just given us the results. So that's how you can do it with more than one condition. The last thing I wanted to show you is that you can output more than just one column. You can output uh, multiple columns and that you don't actually have to just type in the conditions here. You can have it um, pointing at a cell reference, which we're going to do just up here. So I'll create a function here first. And what we'll do is we'll have the range as the whole lot, we'll output the whole lot. And then for the condition, we'll have that there, the transaction type, and we'll have it equal to whatever's there in K2. And then we'll close it off. And then you can see that we've brought all of the payment refund um, data through. So there's four lines there, there's one, two, three and four there. And it's brought out all of the columns there because we've set that to, to look up all of the columns. So what we can do now, just as a final thing, 
is we can actually just change this. So if we delete that, and you can see that's bringing through nothing now, and we change that to auction payment. Like that, hit enter, and now it's bringing through all of the auction payment data instead. So there you go, that's the filter function and how you can use it to bring all kinds of information out of a table of data. We're going to have a look at the sort array function now in Google Sheets, and I'm going to do the exercise here on the sort tab. So just to be clear, we are actually using a function here for sort, we're not actually using the sort tool up here in the data menu. So what we've got is just a little table of information here and we're going to extract some information out of there and put it in here as an array and we're going to do it um, by sorting the data in order. So to start that off, I'll just get the sort function going like so. So the first thing that you need to do is choose the output range and I'm just going to output everything. So I'll just run the mouse over the whole lot there and hit comma. And then the next thing you need to do is choose the column that you want to sort. So I'm going to choose the gross column here. So we're going to sort it by the gross amount. And then once you do that, you need to choose whether it's ascending or descending order. And you can see down here in the notes for ascending, you'll want to put in true and descending you'll want to put in false. So I'll just choose that range and then hit comma and then I'll put in true and close it off. And there you go. So now we have brought all of the data here over into here and we've got it sorted in ascending order for the gross amounts here. So you can see it starts off with the largest minus amount and it finishes off with the largest positive amount. So that's how you can do it with just one sort criteria. You can also have multiple sort criteria. So we'll, we'll do it down here. We'll sort it by date and then we'll sort it by quantity. So I'll just start that function off like so. And again, we'll just get the whole lot as our output. And now we want to do the date so I'll just put the dates in like that and we'll do it in ascending order. And then to do our next criteria, we just need to put in a comma and then grab all the quantities there. And that one I'll do in descending order. So I'll type in false, close it off and hit enter. So now we have everything sorted by date first and you can see that starts on the 18th of July and finishes there on the 4th of November and everything in between, so that's fine. And then the second way that it's sorted is by the quantities. So we have, we have four transactions there on the 15th of the 8th and if we go over here we can see that these transactions are listed in descending order based on the quantity. So we've got three, two, one, and one. So that's sorted it out by the two different criteria. And just like for the rest of our array functions, we've just put the one function in there in one cell, and it's given us a whole lot of outputs into multiple cells. So that's how you use the sort function in Google Sheets. We're going to have a look now at some database functions that you can use to extract and summarize information from your spreadsheets. So I'm going to do that on the database functions tab. And we're going to have a look at dsum, dAverage, dcount, and dcount A. So these work in a similar way to functions such as sumif, except they're probably a little cleaner and easier to use, particularly when you've got multiple criteria. So what I've got here is a database or table here of information that we're going to look into. And then at the top, I've actually set up the criteria that we're going to use and just set it up so that we can, we can change the criteria. So you'll see that when, when we get started on it. And then down here, we're going to do each of these functions. So we'll start off with dsum, which we'll do here. So we'll just start that one off dsum. And the first thing we need to do is pick our database. And that includes the headers at the top there. 
So we'll just run the mouse over all of that and we'll lock it into place with F4 and hit comma. And then we need to choose our field and the field that we're going to sum is going to be gross. So we can just type that in like that and comma. And then we need to pick our criteria, which I mentioned before I've already set up at the top here. So we'll just mouse over that and hit F4. So our criteria corresponds to some of the headers down here. So we've got quantity there and quantity here, state and state, and then transaction type and transaction type. So we can go ahead and change these once we get the formula going, which we'll do in a minute. So I'll just close that off and finish it. And there you can see now it's summed the gross column based on the criteria up here. So if we were to change that quantity to one, that's given us a different answer now. So it's looking at all the ones in there. So we can put that back to two or we can change it to three and that keeps changing our sum. So that's D sum. Now I've anchored all that into place like that. So I'm just going to copy the function and paste it down here and just change D sum to D average and hit enter. And this is doing exactly the same thing. It's now the average of the gross based on the same criteria. So we can just hit New South Wales there, for example, and there's, there's actually none in there for New South Wales with all that criteria. So I might just change that to one. There we go. We've got some averages in there now. And it's just the same for D count as well. So I'll just copy and paste that down. And as you can see, it's all looking up all the right things because I anchored all those uh, cell references into place. So we can just change that to count. And that's given us a count of six. And then the last one is D count A. So D count A will count the number of times that the text appears rather than a number. So if I just copy that one down and what I'll do is I'll have this look up the suburb column. So I'll just change gross to suburb. Because suburb contains text and then I'll change the function to decount A instead of decount and hit enter and we get a result of six. And once again, we can go through and we can change our criteria. So we can change that to a two that you can see it's only finding one result in the suburb column for a quantity of two, state New South Wales and transaction type of auction payment. So that's how you can use some database functions to look up some data in a big table or a database, particularly where you've got multiple criteria, they can be a little bit more useful and easier to use than functions like sumifs and other lookups. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at a few financial functions in Google Sheets that have to do with interest rates. So on the interest rate functions tab, I've just set up a little exercise for each one of the four functions that I'm going to show you. So we've got the effective rate, the nominal rate, the effective interest rate, and the rate function. And for each of these, I've set up the variables that we need to input there just to make things a bit quicker and easier. So we'll start off with the effect function over here. I'll just start that one off. And what we need for this one is we need a nominal interest rate and then periods per year. And if you open up, it tells you that it's calculating the effective interest rate given the nominal rate and the number of compounding periods per year. So this is a way of working out the compounding interest rate when you're just given the nominal rate. So all we need to do is just reference those cells. So we'll do that one and that one, close it off and hit enter. And this is telling us that if we have a nominal interest rate of 10%, but we have 12 payment periods in a year, we're actually effectively earning 10.47% compounding. So if I change that to just one period, you can see there that that just ends up being the same as the nominal rate, 10%. So we're only getting paid our interest once and it's at 10%. So the effective rate is 10%. And then if I put it up to two, 
that just gets a bit higher because it's compounding now and there's two payment periods and then three, etc., and it keeps going up. And if we just say there's one a month, 12 there, then we end up with 10.47. So the effect function is the way that you can work out an effective compounding rate given these variables. Conversely, there's the nominal function and this does exactly the same thing in reverse. So what I've done here is I've just copied down that effective rate there and put it in here and put the same number of periods and we're going to end up with 10 as the answer for the nominal rate. So I'll just start that one off and show you. And again, you just need to reference the variables like, like that. That, and you can see, just like I said, we actually end up with the 10% there. So again, if I change that to one, it gives us the same interest rate as a nominal rate as it does the compounding rate over here. And then as we change the number of periods, as we increase the number of periods and the number of payments, it reduces that nominal rate down. So if I put that back to 12, then we end up with the 10%. So that's the nominal rate and the effect rate there. Um, you can see that they're basically the opposite to each other. One of them gives you the compounding rate and the other one gives you the nominal rate. So moving down, we've got the int rate function. And what this works out is if you buy and sell an investment and you don't get paid any interest during that period of time, if you sell it for a higher price than you bought it for, it works out an effective interest rate for you. So I'll just show you how that one works. So you can see here, we need a buy date, a sell date, a buy price and a sell price. And I've got all of those down here. So I'll just refer to each of those cells like so. Close it off and hit enter. So what we've got here, if I just actually change that to $100, so we've bought an investment for $100 and we've sold it for $100 and we've bought it on the 1st of January and sold it on the 31st of December. Because we bought and sold it at the same price, we've made no profit at all. So the effective interest rate is zero. Now, if I put that to, if I put that to 110, we've made $10 profit. So we have an effective interest rate of 10%, which is the $10 over the $100 there. And we've done it over the course of 12 months. So that's just 10%. If I change that so that that's actually say July, then we've bought it and sold it seven months later. And in that seven months, we've made $10. So the effective interest rate is a lot higher than 10% now. It's actually 17.14% on an annual basis. So this is a good way of working out what your return on your investment is just as a simple um, interest rate percentage if you weren't getting paid any interest in the meantime and you have all these variables available. So the final one down here is the rate and I'll just type that one in and I'll just bring up the help. So you can see that this one calculates the interest rate of an annuity investment based on a constant amount, periodic payments and the assumption of a comp constant interest rate. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but what this basically means is that if we've got 36 payments here and we're getting $500 as a payment every time, and the present value of the investment is $10,000, then it'll work out an interest rate for us. So I'll just reference those cells. And you can see that that's given us an effective interest rate there of 3.6%. So what we've really got, if I just do a quick little formula down here and I say there's 36 payments of $500. So we're getting paid $18,000 on an investment of $10,000 over 36 payment periods. So we are making a profit. And this is just telling us that the rate is at 3.6%. So if I was to increase just the payments, let's say I double it, make it a thousand, 
then we're getting $36,000 back on our $10,000 investment over 36 periods. So naturally the rate of return goes up. So this rate function is a way that you can assess an annuity investment if you've got the payment periods, the amount of payments that you get as a constant number and the present value of the investment. So that's four finance functions that relate to interest rates that you can use in your spreadsheets. As long as you've got the variables available, then the uh, functions themselves are actually pretty easy to put in. We're going to take a look now at a few financial functions that we can use to work out the value of some investments. So we're going to do that here on the value functions tab. And for each one of the three, I've just set up an exercise where we've got the variables that we need and I've just put in some values for those variables. So we'll start off with the future value. I'll just get that one going. And what we need for this one is we need an interest rate or a discount rate, which I've got at 5%. And then we need the number of payments that we're going to receive, which is 12. And we've got the amount of the payments that we're going to receive, which is $800. And then we also have a present value, which is the current value of the annuity. And I've got that at $5,000. So if we just refer to each of these cells, it will work out the future value for us. So I'll just do that and comma, comma, and then that one as well. I'll just close that off. And we can see there that it's saying that the future value of the investment that we've got at a present value of $5,000 with 12 payments of $800 at a discount rate of 5% is 3754 and 42. So that's how you can work out the future value of an investment. Now we'll have a look at the net present value. So I'll just get that one started down here. So once again, we just need to start off with a discount rate, which I've got here at 5%. So we'll just refer to that and comma. And then we need to put in our cash flows. So I've got four cash inflows down here of $1,500 each. So we can just drag that along like that. And then if we close it off and hit enter, it's telling us that the net present value is $5,318.93. But if we want to make that just the return, so we're saying our initial investment is $5,000, then we can go in there and we can actually just add that minus $5,000 onto the end. And that gives us just the return now, just the 318.93, which is the net present value of the return on top of the $5,000 that we invested initially. So that's how you can do a net present value. And the final one is the present value. So I'll just get that one started here. And once again, we just need a discount rate, which is 5%. And then we've got the number of periods and the payment amount per payment. So we've got 10 there as the number of periods and then the payment amount of $800. So if I just close that one off, you can see there that even though we would be receiving $8,000 over time, so 10 payments of $800, if we use a discount rate to bring it back to today's money, then the present value of the investment is really worth just $6,177.39 in today's money. So that's a very simple formula that you can use there to work out the true present value of some future cash flows. So that's it. That's three pretty handy functions that you can use in Google Sheets to work out the true value of your investments. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at a couple of functions you can use in Google Sheets that relate to investments. So we're going to do that on the investment functions tab. And what I've done here is I've set up all the variables that you need for each function and I've just populated some information in there for each of the variables. So we'll start off with the internal rate of return. And if we get that one going, 
you can see that it just tells us that it calculates the internal rate of return on an investment based on a series of periodic cash flows. So I've got the cash flows down here. So if I just run the mouse over it like that, close it off and hit enter, then we're saying for an, an initial investment of $5,000, if we get four returns of $1,500, then the internal rate of the of return is 7.71%. So that's a pretty easy one. So the next one down is the number of periods. And this one works out the number of payment periods for an investment. So I'll get that one started with n per there. So we need a rate and then we need an amount of the payments and we need a present value. So I've got all that set up here. So we've got 5% as the rate. And then we've got our payment amount being $1,000. And we've got our present value being $10,000. So if I put all that in and close it off, you can see that this is saying that there's 14.21 payment periods. So if we just put in zero for the rate there, you can see in its most basic form here, it's saying that if we've got $10,000 and then we get payments of $1,000 in return, then there's going to be 10 payment periods. So if we put an interest rate on top of 5%, then we need to pay back the interest as well as the investment. So it takes 14.21 payment periods to pay that money back at $1,000 at a time. So the higher the interest rate, the more time it takes to pay back the money. So that's the formula that we can use to work out the number of payment periods for an investment. Conversely, we have a function we can use to work out the amount of the payments if we're given the number of payment periods. So that's the payment function here. I'll just get that one started. And for that one, we need the rate and the number of periods and the present value. So I'll just link to all that over there, close it off. And now it's saying that if we have an investment with a present value of $10,000 and we have 10 payment periods and we're paying a rate of 5%, then we're going to end up making payments of $1,295.05. So once again, if I just put this rate down to nothing, you can see there that because there's no interest on top, we only need to make 10 payments of $1,000 to pay off the investment, which is $10,000. So I'll put that back up to 5%. So that's that one. So the end per and the payment are similar, but one of them works out the number of payment periods and one of them works out the periodic payment amount. And then the final one is the yield. So I'll just get that one started. And this one calculates the annual yield of a security paying periodic interest, such as a US Treasury bond based on price. And you can see that there's a lot of variables in there that it needs. So it's a bit of a complicated one, this one. So I've just laid it all out here. So we've got the settlement date and then we've got the maturity date off into the future. And we've got the rate, the annualized rate of interest. And then we've got the price at which the security is bought per 100 face value. So I've just made that 100. And then we've got the redemption, which is the amount per 100 face or par value, which I've got at 110 and the frequency, which is two, which is the number of interest or coupon payments per year. So there's a lot of complicated information that goes into it. But if you lay it out properly, it's again, just a matter of referring to the cells. So I'll just do that. Like so, and I'll just close it off. And there we are now with a yield of 6.39. So you can come in here and you can muck around with the variables if you like. If you put that to zero, then obviously the yield is gonna be 
a lot lower because there's no interest rate in there. And if we put that redemption to 100, that comes down to 5% um, percent yield, which is exactly the rate in there. So you can play around with the variables there to see how that one works. So that's four functions that you can use there to work out certain things for investments. We're going to have a quick look now at a couple of functions that are specific to Google Sheets that you might find useful. So I'm just going to do that here on the Google Functions tab. The first one is called Google Finance and with Google Finance you can bring through some financial information of some share prices. So I'll just get that one started here, like so. And what you need to do is you need to put in a ticker and then some attributes such as price then you've got a start date and an end date and also an interval either daily or weekly if you want to put those things in. So what I'll do is I'll just actually use what they've got here in the example. So I'll just get the ticker there for Google and also the price. I'll just paste it in there and we'll close that. And that's the live price there of Google shares at the moment. So you can just bring through the one value like that or if we go back into it, we can also put in some dates and then whether we want the daily or weekly price. So I'll just put in a couple of dates. I might say the 1st of January, let's just say 2017 and then we'll do 31st 31st of the same month in 2017 and we'll close that off. So we've got a start date and an end date and then we'll just put in the daily price. So we'll just put daily in there like that. And now when we hit enter, you can see it brings in the closing value of the stocks each day there throughout January in 2017. So that's a function you can use if for some reason you need to get a bunch of stock information um, straight from Google Finance. And the other function I just wanted to show you quickly is Google Translate. So I'll just get that one going. Like so. And then, like it says, it just translates text from one language to another. So once again, we can just put in what it's got here. We'll just put that in there and close it off. And that's just done the translation to English there and if you do want to translate something from a specific language to a specific language you just need to put in the source language and the target language in there like that. I'll just leave that one as is as I'm just demonstrating it at the moment. So that's just a couple of nice um, functions that Google has created for Google Sheets that you can use if you need them. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at a powerful function in Google Sheets called the query function. So the way I've got this set up is I'm going to do my queries here on the query tab, and we're going to look up some data here over on the query data tab. And the way query works, it's very similar to SQL or SQL queries. So the best way to learn that is we'll just get started on the first one. just by typing in query and opening the brackets. And you can see what we need to do is we need to select the data and then we need to put in the query and then we just need to tell Sheets how many header rows there are. So we'll go over here and select the data. We'll just run the mouse over the whole lot like that. And I'm going to F4 lock that into place because we're going to copy and paste this function shortly and move it around. And then the next thing we need to do is our query and the first thing we're going to do is just return a whole column of data which is going to be if I scroll up it's going to be this gross column so that's column F so we need to use F as the identifier and we need to use select as the clause and we also need to wrap that up in quotes so if I just open the quotes 
and then type in select and then put in a capital F to identify the column and close the quotes and hit comma then that's our query done so the next thing we need to do is just tell sheets how many header rows there are so there's one header row at the top there so we'll just put one and then we can close the whole thing off and hit enter and you can see there that this query has now brought the entire data set there in column F over including the actual header row itself so if we go back and have a quick look you can see we've got gross and then 133, 298.50 etc and over here we've got the same thing and that goes all the way down to the bottom of the data so that's a simple select clause there to bring one column of data over the next thing I'm going to do is show you that you can select more than one column so we're going to do three columns and the columns that we're going to do are going to be the first name, the last name, and the gross. So we'll go back, and that was, sorry, I should just say, so that's columns I, J, and then F. So if we come back over here, and we just copy and paste that function, because we did lock the references in there for our, um, our references to our data. So all we need to do is we just need to put the names of those columns in here. So it was I and then comma and J and comma and then we've already got F. So if we hit enter there, that's brought in the first name, the last name and the gross and it's brought in all the data there for everyone. So that's how you can use the select clause to bring in multiple uh, columns of data. The next thing I'm going to show you is how you can be a bit more selective with the data that you bring over. So you don't just have to bring over entire columns of data. You can actually uh, basically filter them down to what you want. So what we're going to do, if we go back to our data, I think we're going to have a look at, say, the gross, and we'll bring it in by state. And we'll put a clause on there saying that we just want the states to be New South Wales. So let's just go back to our query. So we're looking at um, columns F and columns L. So if we come back over here and let's just grab that one again and paste it there. So we've got F. And we'll just put a comma L and just hit enter. So now we've got gross and we've got state. So in order to basically filter this so that it's just the New South Wales results, we just need to go back into our query and type in where, and then L, and we need to say equals NSW for New South Wales, but we need to just put it in single quotes because it's text. If it was a number, we wouldn't need to put it in quotes. We can just put the number in. So I'll just put the single quote there, New South Wales, and close it, and then hit enter, and there we go. So you can see it's brought in all of the gross amounts, if I just click back on here, so all of the amounts in column F and column L, where column L equals New South Wales. So that's how you can use the where clause there to filter down your information a bit. And in the next one, I'll show you how we can go even further with that. And we'll actually put a couple of conditions in there. So we'll, we, we'll still use where, but we'll use and as well. And with that one, we'll filter column B as well, so that we just have the auction payment um, lines in there. So we can copy that one over and paste it there. So we've got the same thing. And then we've got where... L equals New South Wales. So we'll go back into our query and we'll say and and we want it to be B equals and we'll open the single quotes again. Type in auction payment. Close the single quote so that all looks like it's going to work. Hit enter. And now we've just got the auction payment amount, so we don't have any refunds in there anymore. And you can see all of these ones that were minuses, that were for refunds, they're not in there anymore. 
So we've been able to filter our results by two different variables there. We've got state New South Wales and payment type being auction payment. So the next thing I want to do is show you that you can actually uh, put your results in order as well. So if we just copy and paste that one over there, so we've got the same thing, we can use another clause called order by, and we can put that in ascending or descending order. So I'll just click into the end of our query there and type order by. And then we can just do, let's just say we do order by F and we'll just hit enter. And now you can see that that's given us in ascending order, the results by the gross, which was in column F. So when you use order by, it automatically defaults to ascending unless you tell it to do it by descending. So we've successfully done ascending. So if you wanted to change that to descending, you just need to go in and type in DESC like that for descending and hit enter and there you go. So it swapped it around to descending order now. So that's how you can do your ascending and descending order. And the last thing I wanted to show you, if we copy and paste that over there, is that you can also just limit your results to a certain number. So if you just wanted to say that the first three results, you can again just go back into your query and on the end just say limit and three and hit enter. And there you go. So it's got the header there and it's just got the first three results in descending order filtered out by uh, state and it's also filtered out by auction payment. So as you can see, there's quite a lot that you can do with the query function and we've only just covered a little bit of it. So I just wanted to show you where you can go to get more information on this query and learn more about it. So if I just click on the query and bring up the little help box here, if you click on learn more about query and then you follow this link here, it will open up a web page where there's just all kinds of information here on the query lang language that's used. And you can see here, down here, there's some subheadings where we've got some of the clauses that we use like select and, and where and limit, for example, but there's other ones as well. And there's also all kinds of other things, other functions, etc. So if you want to get into using the query function a lot more than we have done, then I suggest you have a read through this page and have a look at all the things that you can do with it. In this video, we're going to have a look at sparklines in Google Sheets. So I'm going to do that on the sparkline tab. And what I've done is I've just set up a couple of lines here with some data that's in trends. And that's what you need in order to create sparklines. And all you need to do is create a sparkline function. So like that. And then you just need to choose the actual data like this and then close it off and hit enter. And you can see there that it just gives you a graphical representation of the trend of the data. So going from 1.1 to 1.2 to 1.3, that line goes up like that. And then it comes back down and back up to 1.3 in the end there. So if I just copy that one and paste it down on these other rows, these ones are picking up the data there for the other rows. And you can see that they have, again, just created some trends there. And I've, I've put some pretty extreme differences here on this bottom one. So it goes from 14 being the lowest right up to 205,000 there as the highest. So that's why we get that peak in there. So that's how you can create a basic spark line. And by default, they come out as line charts like this. You can also do different things to them. So if we go back into the function, you can see here that there's some chart type um, variables that we can play with to create different types of charts. And if you actually click on this, learn more about Sparkline, it will open up a support page like this. And if you look down, there's actually quite a lot of different things that you can do to your Sparklines. So we won't have a look through all of them, but I'll just quickly show you a couple of the things that you can do. 
So if we go back in here and we'll just change the chart type to a column chart and then I'll also just make it so that the maximum color or the top color is red. So if we go back over here, we can see we've got column there for our chart type. That's one of the options we've got. And we've got this high color down here as well. So we're going to use those. So I'll go back in here and you can see the syntax here. It's telling us that we need to put that inside of curly brackets. So I'll just hit comma and then open up our curly brackets. And then we actually do need to put chart type in there. So I'll just copy that and paste it in just like that. And then we're not going to create a bar chart. We're going to create a column chart. So I'll just type that in. And in fact, if we just close that off and hit enter now, you can see that I've changed that to a column chart now. So that's one of the things we're going to do. And the other thing is I just want to make that high value red. So if I go back in and I just put a semicolon there and I just type in high color and then comma and red in quotes and then we'll hit enter and you can see there that it's picked 1.3 as the highest value which has occurred twice and it's colored those columns in red so i'll just copy and paste that down for each one of these as well so you can see they've just got the one value on each one there um, as a high color so that's why there's only one red on each one there so that's a couple of different things that you can do with your spark lines. And like I said before, there's actually a lot more that you can do. So you can come over here and have a look at all the different things that you can do. So that's how you create them. And I just wanted to point out just one little shortcoming of spark lines is that these are not necessarily going to be on the same scales. So if you've got um, different sequences of numbers on different lines that are just completely different, then they technically they should be on different scales and different charts, but they all sort of end up on approximately the same scale because they're inside these cells. So we've got the number 14 here and the number 205,000 there. But then at the top here, the highest value there is nine and that goes all the way to the top. And nine is obviously a lot different to 205,000. So what I'm saying is it's a bit hard to compare these charts line by line if the sequences of numbers are just on completely different scales and they're just completely different to each other. So you really just need to be careful with these and just make sure that if you have them all together like this, that they're representing basically the same kinds of numbers. So that's how you can create and manipulate spark lines in Google Sheets. I'm going to show you now how you can import some data into Google Sheets from a web page. So if you go to the import HTML tab, I'm going to do it there and I'll just start off the function like so. And what you need to do is you need to put in the URL of the web page, which I've got down here. And then you need to put in um, what, what kind of information you're bringing back. So whether it's a table or a list, and then you can also put an index number in there, which I'll show you how that works in a second. So we've just started that off. I'll just get out of there and then we'll come down here and we'll just copy the URL and come in here and paste it into here, which we need to put in quotes like that. And then on that page, there's a few tables. So I'm going to put in table And I'm just going to put the index number as one and close it off. In fact, it was already closed. So I'll just hit enter. And what we get now is this table of data that's come through from the web page. Now, if I go to the web page itself, you can see here it's got people, male, female, and median age. And it's got a bit of information over here on each of those stats. If we go back, it's brought that through over here. So this function has 
if I just click on the function, it's looked at the web page and it's gone to find a table and it's gone to find the first table. So if I change that number to two and hit enter, you can see there that it's brought through a different um, table of data there. So if we go back to the page itself, it's this one here where it's got families and then average children, etc. So there it is, families and average children. So that number on the end there, which here is called an index number, you can change that to tell Sheets which table, if there's multiple tables on this page, which one you want it to actually bring in. And you can also do this for lists as well. So I've got a table coming through, but just like it says here in the help, if there are lists of data on the page that you're looking at, you can just type in list and you can bring in the list instead. So that's how you use the import HTML function in Google Sheets. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at how you can import a range of data from one spreadsheet to another in Google Sheets. So I'm going to do it on the import range tab here and I'll do the function up here. So I'll just get it started like so. And what this is saying is that we need to put in the URL of the source spreadsheet and then we just need to put in the range of cells as well. So I don't actually have a source spreadsheet at the moment. So I'll just get out of there and go to file and new spreadsheet. And this is going to be the spreadsheet that's our source of information. So I'll just create a little range of data first. So I'll just go say one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to import this range of data into here. So if we go back into our function, you can see there that it says to get the spreadsheet URL. So you can get the whole thing like that, or if you like, you can actually just grab this bit of code that starts just there behind that backslash and just goes there up to the next backslash. And you can copy that out and you can paste it into here, but you'll need to put it in quotes like that. And then we just need to do the range. So let's just go and have a look at the range that we want, which is cells B2 to D3. So I'll just come back here and put that in. We'll need to put that in quotes. Like that. And if we hit enter, that will now ask us if we want to connect the sheets together. So we'll just hit allow access. And there you go. That's brought through the range of data that we had over there. So let's just have a look quickly now and see what happens if we actually change this range. So we'll change that to say seven, eight, and nine. Come back over here. And you can see that that's changed it now to seven, eight, and nine. So that's a dynamic reference there, the import range. If you change it in the source um, document, it will also change it here uh, where it's bringing it through. So that's how you can use import range to bring a range of data from one spreadsheet into another in Google Sheets. We're going to have a look now at how you can combine together some of the functions and formulas that we've learned to do some fairly powerful things in Google Sheets. So I'm going to do it on this combining functions sheet that I've set up. And what I've got is a table of data down the bottom here. And then we're just going to use some functions to look up into this table of data and extract some information and also sort it and filter it. So what we want to do is just with the one combined formula is grab all of the data for the top five total sales in New South Wales with the total sales being the quantity times the gross. So it will be that times that. So we're just gonna take this step by step. So we'll start off by calculating that total sales, the quantity and the gross. And then of course we want to return the results as an array. 
So the way to do that is to use an array formula, which we'll just start off like that. And then all we need to do is come down here and get the formula itself to work. So we want that column of data multiplied by that column of data. I'm just gonna anchor it all into place like so. And in fact, we don't need comma. We need to close that off and hit enter. And now we've got a column of information here. That's the quantity by the gross. So we'll just double check that. We can see the first one here that has a quantity of more than one is four times the 314. So we've got 133, 298, and then 314. And up here we've got 133, 298, and then that one is the four times the 314. So that's fine, we've got all that now. So the next thing that we want to do is we want this to be all of the data that comes through. We don't just want this one column of data. So we can do that with our curly brackets. So we'll just start off the curly brackets there and then we'll say the first thing that we want to come through is all of the information for all of the sales. And again, I'll just anchor that into place and we'll hit comma and I'll just come up the end, close off the curly brackets. And now we have all of the data coming through for each column, which you can see matches up down below here. So you've got all the columns matching up, the first names and the last names, etc. And then we've got that column on the end, which is that array formula there, which is doing the total sales for us. So that's the first couple of steps done. The next thing that we want to do is we want to filter the data because we only want the sales and we want them for New South Wales. So we're going to wrap the whole thing in a filter function. So we can just start that off like this. And then where it says range, what we've got in there already, that's the range. So we've got that in there. We can just hit comma afterwards. And then we just need to put in our conditions. So the first condition that I'm going to put in, I'll just put in the sales first. So we'll just mouse over our original table of data. And again, I'll just lock it in. And then we want that to only be the sales. So we'll just type in sale there in quotes. And if we close that off and just hit enter now, you can see that we don't have any refunds anymore. We've just got sales. So all those refunds are out and we've got all of the states over here. So now we just need to put in a second filter condition. So we'll just hit comma and then we can choose all of our states and I'll just F4 that. And then we'll say equals NSW for New South Wales. We've already closed off the brackets when we did our first filter. So I'll hit enter and there we go. So now it's filtered it down to just be the New South Wales entries. So that's looking pretty good so far. The next thing we want to do is we want to actually sort the remaining data because we want to just have the top five total sales in there. So we need to be able to have that in order over here. So if we wrap the whole thing up in a sort function, like so, so we've got our range, which is the whole thing. The sort column is that column there, which is the 14th column along. So I'll just type in 14. And now we just need to tell it whether we want it in ascending or descending order. And if we look at the help, we've got true or false where false is in descending order. So that's what we want. Close off the brackets and hit enter. And now over here on our total sales, we've got the highest one there followed by the next one down all the way down to the lowest. So we've got six results remaining there and we only want the top five. So we can finish this off now by doing an array constraint function. And again, we're going to wrap the whole lot 
in that function. So we can start that off at the front there. Like so. And the input range is again, the whole thing that we've typed in there already. So all we need to do now is just tell it the number of rows and the number of columns. The number of rows is five, because we want the top five. And the number of columns is 14, because there's actually 14 columns of data here. So we can do that and close it off. And that's it, it's knocked, knocked that sixth one out there. So it's just the top five now. So now with that one combination of functions, we've got all of the data from that table below for the top five total sales in New South Wales, and we've got them in order there. So that's just an exercise to show you how you can combine some of these functions together to do powerful things. Obviously there's a lot of functions and there's a lot of different combinations that you can come up with. So you can do all kinds of things here in Google Sheets with these functions. I just wanted to give you a demonstration of one particular exercise just so you could have a look and see how it's done. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at how you can create and use named ranges in Google Sheets to help you with your cell references in your functions. So the way I've got this set up is we're going to do the exercises on this named ranges tab. And I've got the data that we're going to create the ranges on over here in the named ranges data tab. So the first thing I'll show you is that there is actually a named ranges panel. So if you go to data and named ranges, it brings up this panel here over on the side. And from here you can add ranges. And once you've got them in there, you can also edit them and delete them and add more. So that's one way you can do it. And the other way you can do it is actually just to go and mouse over the data. And then if you right click, you just, you just go to define the named range and create it from there. So what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a sum if function without a named range. And then we're going to create a sum if function with a range just to see the difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum if this gross column here, and we're going to use the transaction type as the criteria. So we need to create two named ranges and one of them is going to be the transaction type. So we can just mouse over that, right click, go to define the name range. And then I'm just going to give it a name and you can see there it brings up a name um, automatically. So you can just type over that. And it also gives you the cell references here, which you can edit if you need to. So I'm just gonna call this trans type and click done. So now we have our first named range in there called trans type and there's the cell references. And then I'm going to do another one. So we can just click on add a range and I'm gonna call this one gross. And I want the cell references to be these cells here. And so I'll click okay. And done. And now we have our two named ranges that we're going to use for our sum if function. So if we go back over here, what we're gonna do now is just create a regular sum if. So I'll just get that started. And we need the range and the criteria. So we need to go over here and get the range, which are these cells here. And the criteria is I want to add up all of the ones that are sale. So I'll just type in sale there in quotes and close it off, comma. And then the sum range is going to be gross because I want to do a sum of the gross amounts. So if I close that off and hit enter, you can see we get a result there. And we've got a fairly long function in there because we're referring to another sheet. So it's sort of not really all that clean. So what we can do is we can achieve exactly the same thing with our named ranges. So we'll just do a sum if here like that. And so for the range, we want to look up trans type. So if we start typing that in, it actually brings it up as an option. So we can just choose it like that. 
and then the criteria is going to be the same as we had in the other one. So it's sale. And now the sum range is going to be the gross named range. So if we start typing that, it'll bring up gross. We can just choose it, close it off, hit enter, and there you go. So we get exactly the same answer as we did before, but we just have a much cleaner looking function there. You can see it's it's a lot easier to read. So it's that's one of the main purposes of these ranges is that it just makes it a bit tidier when you do these functions, particularly if they're much longer and more complicated functions than just the simple one that we've done here. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. The next thing I wanted to show you is how it can work with arrays. So if we just start off an array where we're just going to bring that data over into this worksheet with our curly brackets, so we'll do that. And we'll go over here and we'll do that one comma and gross close off the curly brackets hit enter and there you go so we've brought we've brought all that data over now just with our simple curly brackets um, array function there if we want to achieve the same thing with named ranges as you probably guessed, we just go in and type in the name of the named ranges. So we can do trans type, comma, and gross. And that's brought in exactly the same information there. So it might seem almost a little bit pointless doing it that way, um, just because of the way that I've done it here, because I've, I've only used um, very simple um, functions here for the exercise. So we're just bringing in two bits of data really. But if you've got data that's spread over a whole lot of worksheets and you want to combine it into one worksheet with an array function, then you can go to all those other worksheets and you can set up named ranges and then you can just come in here, do a curly brackets and just type in the names of all the um, named ranges rather than having all these cell references going to all the different pages. So it's a, it's a much, much cleaner way of combining data into one worksheet. And also, like I mentioned before, if you're going to do functions like some ifs or far more um, complicated functions, particularly if you're going to do nested functions where there's a whole bunch of them in together, doing names ranges will help you to be able to read your functions and what you're doing a lot better than just having a whole lot of long um, cell references like that referring to other worksheets. So that's a first look at named ranges. And what we've done here is we've created what you could call fixed ranges where we just have fixed cell references. And what I mean by that is if we add more data down to the bottom here, it won't actually feed through here. So in the next lesson, we're going to have a look at how you can make your ranges a bit more dynamic. So if you add data on, then the functions that you use will be able to pick up that data. So that's in the next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to continue on with the exercise from the last lesson, and we're going to have a look at how you can make your named ranges a bit more dynamic. So in the last lesson, we created some sum ifs and also some arrays using named ranges and also just using normal cell references. And the way we've got our named ranges set up, so for trans type and gross, they've got some fixed cell references, so F2 to F37 and B2 to B37. And what that means is if we go over to the data and then we add more information down the bottom here, so on row 38, so let's say we just put a sale in and we'll put it in for say a large amount of money, say $100,000. And we go back over here and look at our sum ifs. It hasn't actually picked that up. So that won't pick it up through that one because it only goes down to B37. And it won't pick it up through the named range because the named range also just goes down to row 37. So they're not dynamic at all. We can't just add information down the bottom and have it pick up. So what we can do is we can create named ranges that are a bit more dynamic. And the way to do that 
is you just simply choose the entire column or row or worksheet or whatever it is that you're using for your range. So for this trans type range, we can create another one where we just choose the entire column like this. So let's just, let's just start off first. We'll just get rid of that information down the bottom there. And then we'll choose column B and we'll add a range and we'll call it trans type. And we can't give it the exact same name as the other one. So because this is the dynamic range, we'll just call it trans type D. Just so we know it's the dynamic one and hit done. And then we'll do the same thing for gross, where we'll just choose the whole column at a range. And we'll call that gross D. And then you can see the cells that it's referring to are the whole column B and column F. So if we come back over here, our results are still the same. So what we need to do is in the dynamic section here, we'll do exactly the same function as there, except we'll just choose the dynamic ranges. So we'll just start that one off. So we'll do a sum if with the range being trans type D one and we're still looking up the sales and then we want this to be gross D like that so the only difference between the two is that's looking up the dynamic ones and that's looking up the fixed ones so we get the same result of course because we've got the same um, data being looked up but if we come back in here now and we add our sale down the bottom and we put the hundred thousand dollars in again and we go back and have a look at our results we can see that the dynamic one has actually picked up the hundred thousand dollars and added it in so we can add whatever we like now down to the bottom of this data all the way down to the bottom of the spreadsheet and the gross d and the trans type d will pick it up so that's how it works for the sum if and it works exactly the same for the array that we had over here. So remember we had one there with just fixed cell references. And then we had one here with trans type and gross, which again, just have the fixed cell references there. So now we can do one where we look up um, trans type D and gross D. So we'll just go curly brackets, trans type D and gross D, close it off. And then down the bottom there, we've got the $100,000 sale at the bottom. You can see it's also actually picked up the headers because we're looking at the entire column. So it's picking up the trans type and the gross header at the top up there, which is why we've actually got, it looks like we've got two um, extra rows down the bottom, but we've got an extra row at the top and an extra down the bottom. And then just to finish off, we'll, we'll just create another one again. So we'll do sale again and put $500,000 in there and that's pulling the data through on the array there and it's also adding it up there and let's also just put a refund in so we'll do minus a million dollars as a refund and so that's pulled the data through, of course, because we're just pulling raw data through with our array function. And the sum if is only adding up the sales. So the refund hasn't come through there. So that's how you can create more dynamic named ranges to help you manipulate data with your ranges. I just wanted to finish off our lessons on named ranges by just quickly showing you how you can use the query function with named ranges. So I'm just going to do it here in this uh, cell C17. So I'll just start off the query function. And for the data, we can just refer to one of our named ranges. So I'll just refer to the gross D range one there and then the next thing we 
need to do is just put in our query. So I'm just going to start off with select and F because that's in column F over on our named range data page. And let's see what happens if we finish that one off. So that's brought in all of the data there all the way down to that um, minus one million because we're using the dynamic one. So you can use the query function as well with these named ranges and you can see it comes up much cleaner than if you had cell references. And if we wanted to make that one um, a little more exact with what it's bringing through, we could do something like we could say, say where F is um, say greater than 200 and now that's, bring, that's just bringing through the transactions that are greater than $200. And then the last thing is just over here where it's bringing through that header because over here, as you might remember, we've got the whole column as the named range, including that header. We can change that if we go in and just hit comma, you can see it gives us this option at the end to tell it what to do with the headers. And if we put a zero in there and hit enter, it will ignore that header row. So now we're just bringing through the data itself and we're just bringing through the transactions that are more than $200 with our query. So obviously you can do much more complicated queries than that. I just wanted to show you a simple one just so you can see that you can use named ranges with the query function as well. In this lesson, we're going to create a couple of fairly quick and simple macros in Google Sheets just to see how they work. So I'm going to do that here on the macros tab. And what we've got here is just a table of data and we've got some gross sales amounts and some fees that we need to take off in order to get the net amounts. So I'm going to create a macro that will just do that for us. Um, just, just in a single cell. So for macros, what you can do is you can go to the tools menu and you can see here we've got two things. We've got the script editor, which you can use after you've recorded macros. And then you've got the macros menu. So you can actually import some macros. We're not going to do that, but I just wanted to show you that you can if you've got macros set up in other spreadsheets. And you can also record macros, which is what we're going to do. So if I click on record, that has actually started recording the macro already. And there's two different ways it, it can create a macro. One is by using absolute cell references. And the other one is, is, is with relative cell references. So I'm going to start off with absolute references, and then I'll show you what the difference is between the two. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a quick formula here if I click on equals to do E2 plus F2 to work out the net sales amount because these are minuses here. So we actually need to add them onto the gross amount. And then if I click enter, that gives us $129.24 as the net amount. So that's what I want the macro to do. So I can go down here now and click save to stop recording. And then we can give the macro a name and also give it a shortcut key. So the name I'll give it is just net calculation or net calc. And this is the one that uses the absolute cell references. So just to identify it, I'll type in absolute. Like that. So that's the full name of it, net calc absolute. And I'm going to give it a short cut as well. So if we type control alt shift and the number one together, it will run that macro for us. So we'll see that in a minute. So I'll click on save. And now we've got that macro saved. You can see down here, it says it said saved and we can go straight in to edit the script if we like through here, but we're not going to do that for the moment. So that's the absolute reference macro recorded. The next thing I want to do is record the exact same thing, but for relative cell references. So we can do that anywhere down on this column. So once again, we'll go to tools 
macros and record. And this time we'll choose relative references. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. So equals and that one plus that one and enter. And now we can save it. Call it net calc and relative. And I'm going to give this one the shortcut of two. So control alt shift and two and hit save. And now that's saved. So if I just go back up here and look in manage macros, you can see there that we've got them both saved now, the absolute and the relative, and we've got the short keys there, one and two. And over on the side here, there's some little menus. So if you wanted to go in and edit the script or you wanted to delete them, you can just choose one of these like that. So that's how you record your macros and how you assign the short keys. So if I just delete that, I'll show you how they work now. So if, if we hit control, alt, shift and one, it will run the first macro that, that we recorded with the absolute references. So I'm just going to do that like so. And you can see there it ran the script and then it performed the calculation. It put that formula in there and, and perform the calculation for us. Now, if I delete that and then I move down into another cell and I do it again, control alt shift and one, it runs it again back up here. So you can see that no matter where I start from anywhere on this worksheet, control alt shift one, it just does it right there. So that's opposed to the other one we, that, that we recorded with the relative references. So that's control alt shift and two, which I'll press now. And that did it right where we are. So if I come down to another cell, run it there and it does it like that. So if we go into our script editor, we can have a look at why that is. And so this is the coding that we created when we created those macros. And the first one here, net calc absolute, that's the one with the absolute references. And this is the one with the relative references. And even without knowing much about the coding, you can see here that these have fixed cell references. So this one goes to cell G2 and then it does E2 plus F2. So it goes to G2 and then does E2 plus F2. So it doesn't matter where you start from on the uh, worksheet. It doesn't matter where you put your mouse or where you put your active cell. It's always going to go there and do those and then it will finish down there on G3. Whereas with the relative one, it goes to the active cell that you're on and then it goes two columns over to the left and then does the plus, it adds one column over to the left. So if you've got it here, it goes two columns over to the left and then plus one column over to the left. So that's why you can put your mouse anywhere and you can activate any cell you like down in this column and it will do it properly for you with the macro that's set to relative references. So that's the difference between the two different kinds of macros. And that's really what I wanted to show you in this exercise. So it's, it's a very um, simple calculation that I did, but it gives you some idea as to what you can achieve with macros so that you can automate some repetitive tasks. So if you want to learn more about macros, obviously you can go through and you can do all kinds of things. So it's not just formulas that you can do, you can do um, formatting as well and a bunch of other things. And then if you want to um, clean up your code or if you want to just program things in with code, you can go ahead and just learn more about the language that is used for macros and you can make them even cleaner and more useful. So that's all I wanted to cover today. That was more of just an introduction to macros and just a way of showing you the difference between the absolute references and the relative references.